I'd like to move on to our next presentation. Uh, it will be given by Ann Bartuska. Ann is a senior advisor at Resources for the Future. And the title of her talk is a Managing Forests for Climate Mitigation. On to you, Ann. Well, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this workshop. Um, sitting here in Washington, DC, in the middle of a lot of policy work, that's going to be the focus of my talk as I go through this. I do want to thank um, the US Forest Service Office of Sustainability and Climate for the, a lot of the graphics I'm using, as well as the Forest Climate Working Group for many of the ideas that I'll be walking through. There's a lot of activity in Washington right now associated with the whole notion of natural climate solutions. It's, it's really been triggered, I think, in part by the IPCC 1.5 study but it has really gained momentum from a lot of the community. And, and I just wanted to put this out there in terms of the policy context for this Congress, because there is so much discussion taking place right now, starting with, or maybe not starting with, but being acknowledging that there is the Trillion Trees Initiative that the White House is, um, has promoted and is now moving forward under the American forests, as well as the World um, Economic Forum. But beyond that, in terms of practical application, in instructing agencies and organizations to um, actually make things happen, we have several bills that have been put forward that are um, really focusing on the notion of reforestation, but reforestation within the context of climate mitigation. And so in some ways, it's a, it's, very, it's a hopeful sign that there is a lot of energy and enthusiasm about doing this kind of work. The challenge, of course, is doing it right and having legislation that really captures the needs of, of being able to not only plant trees in terms of reforestation, but also achieve the goals that we've set for ourselves. And in the middle of that, you'll note the um, Senate bill Growing Climate Solutions Act really is addressing some of the soils issues that Francesca just talked about, which is giving landowners the opportunity to uh, improve their, um, their land use in order to directly address the carbon issue. Now, these bills really do just talk about different aspects of reforestation. They don't include um, the reforestation backlog on federal lands, which are another set of, of um, legislation and guidance, as well as wildfire reduction. So my point is a lot of energy going into the topic and a lot of opportunities to guide success, but what does that look like? Um, the, part of the reason for moving this way is, I, and you're gonna see this figure over and over again, you already have, um, but in terms of, of being able to use natural um, approaches or native natural based approaches to climate, reforestation and forest management are really at, at the top of the list. And so there is a lot of opportunity for success and progress, even though we recognize, just as Chris Field said yesterday, that there has to be a balance of many different things going on. This is not the solution, but it does add to the, the body of opportunity. But if you really start thinking about um, reforestation, I think one of the challenges that a lot of the legislation has is um, it's not just about tree planting. And so what we're trying, we've been trying to do here in, in DC is uh, bring a focus on this entire life cycle because there are multiple components that have to be addressed, starting with what seed are you going to be using? And, and you may wanna use improved seed mixes so that you actually get some of the diversity that you want to achieve within that landscape there's also aspects of nursery production, having the, the people to be able to do that production and then having, having sufficient capability um, to go out and plant. It's not all plantation forestry. There is a lot of uh, reforestation going on in natural landscapes that does require a lot of back, back breaking work. And then it's, it's more than just putting the tree in the ground. You also have to manage to ensure success, which could be three to six or eight years out from that initial tree planting. So being able to manage all of that and understand what is happening along that entire life cycle is a really critical to success. Whether or not you go into the, the figure that is, a, um, is an accruing stand, a forest that is, is building carbon, 
or into a landscape that has both um, utilization through harvesting and products to natural growing sites and being able to, car to balance and understand the carbon flow within all of those different pieces. So as we talk about this whole notion of reforestation within the context of climate mitigation, this is the picture that we have to have in mind. It's from the seed to the long-term success if we really want to achieve our goals over time. It's also about um, increasing our understanding of what is the, the um, spatial and temporal scale. There is a very um, simple look at it. You have aspects of forest management that produce carbon and CO2 on the left, and this is deforestation, forest management activities of fire that do release carbon. And then you have processes of growth that, are, that take up that carbon and that net balance. But within those particular, that very, what is ostensibly a simple system, there's actually a lot of complexities. And many of you know this, that you have, you have growing, um, growing stocks, you have forests that are continuing to degrade and increase, and as demonstrated here in the lower left of the graphic. Um, but then you have these pulses of CO2 that come from fire. And what is the balance across the landscape of those two conditions? Um, you also have opportunities for harvesting where you're going to be releasing CO2 as part of decomposition, but you also have opportunities to take up more carbon as some of that, that forest grows. So part of the challenge, and as we talk about what research is needed, is being able to quantify all of those different pathways at the right scale that actually gives us the information we need to be able to make decisions over and especially over what part of the landscape we're actually operating in. And then um, as, an e as an ecosystem person myself, I like to think of the bigger ecosystem. It's not just the forest, but there is a connectivity between forests and agricultural lands because of land use trade-offs that are being made. In fact, there probably should be another box here that shows development pressure because um, often when these, far, these lands go out of being forested and that if they don't go to ag, they may go into development, which has a lot of, of economic value associated with it. So being able to look across those, and I, and I actually appreciate the soil connectivity across those, those different land uses. But we also wanna take into account if you are extracting wood for various purposes, um, part maybe stimulating the, um, the actual through thinnings, the, the, the health of that forest, or because you are um, deliberately having trees to be producing a product, then we also need to think about where is that material going? It could go into biomass energy, uh, which is a CO2 producer, but is that offsetting at what level and what scale the uh, use of fossil fuels? Similarly, if you're taking wood out of the forest and putting it into a product that has longer term um, use like furniture or houses um, that could be 50 to 100 to 150 years, then you're also offsetting the use for other materials. So the substitution effect is also part of the net calculus that we want to take at scale over and whether that again be temporal scale or landscape scale, or spatial scale. And then, the, um, and then I think we also want to keep in mind, and, and this is part of the messaging as we've talked to policymakers here in DC, is um, again, it's not just taking that slice of the forest and focusing just on that component. It's how do, how do these different pieces interact and how do you want to have a integrated approach to forest management and to the economics of forest products that allow you to and support the growth of healthy forests, even as you are uh, through market mechanisms, keeping that land in forest because you're producing products. And so it really is a very a, a balancing act, frankly, from an economic standpoint, but it's also um, a challenge in terms of thinking about the landscape and the scale at which some of these activities are taking place. Perhaps one of the, um, the more challenging ones, and I'll come back to this, is where does biomass and bioenergy fit? And there is a, a, a long history of the industry using bioenergy to offset other energy uses so that they actually have a closed loop system within their own, own production. But as we think about it as a substitute for fossil fuels, how do we get the numbers right? And 
again, I'll come back to that, but that's, that is, I think this balancing between the, um, the production of a product and what that does in terms of CO2 emissions versus long-term storage um, is, is going to be part of our calculus. In a, in a more complicated view then, if we look at the, and I'm just gonna look on the, the right side of the, the screen, the, the broad view, is how do we then capture this cumulative carbon storage aspect? And this is this is a graphic that um, has been used in, in several different reports now on how you then stack up the different places where um, carbon is going within the whole wood product cycle, starting with the soil and the pool that's there, that the litter has been mentioned, but also continuing in um, as trees are harvested for purposes and grow, there's carbon accumulation and then some systems that continues to go up where some of that is being converted to a product. Let's capture the amount of, of carbon that is going into those products. The substitution effects, for example, because of, of paper versus, some, uh, versus plastic might be an example, but also in terms of building materials as you're trading off using of concrete and steel and the growth of the mass timber, the large uh, tall wood buildings right now is really pushing the envelope on what we know about how much can this particular sink um, grow, literally. And then the energy substitution piece. So you, you're, as you look at all of the, these components, there um, overall is a, a net decrease in CO2 emissions because of the accumulation of all the different products and pathways that we're considering. And I did said I wanted to come back to, to bioenergy because um, I think it is one that we need to continue to get our understanding and our arms around uh, what is the, the total opportunity here? What is the trade-off in, in terms of um, wood use and through whether it be pellets or other biomass uses versus fossil fuels? But also, how does that how does that net out in um, being able to switch to a wood bioenergy for some part of our energy use within the country? And I think that within the U.S., that is, um, as many people have said, it's this is not a one size fits all. It's not the sole approach to uh, being able to reduce fossil fuel emissions. It is but it's one component that enables us to achieve a net gain in um, being able to reduce the amount of CO2 and accumulate more carbon. Part of the reason for thinking about this, this pool as well as some of the others that I mentioned before is um, if a landowner has an opportunity to keep forests and forests, they do need to have an economic driver in most cases to be able to do that. It could be a conservation easement, but it also could be um, selling part of that land for product. And one of those products could be bioenergy. And so if we can um, think about how that combination and being able to give a, a landowner the ability to manage for these products so that they do have an economic incentive to stay on the land. And that is, I think, the um, one of the net issues that we've been talking quite a bit in the forest community is that exact trade-off and what are what are the opportunities for um, investment in forest land so that you do have positive reforestation there we go um, and just the the net to look at net balance of the various um, investment policies that are out there incentives to being able to keep land in forests incentives to um, expand the capacity. There, there is 11 million, and some of you know this and some of you may not, 11 million private forest landowners in this country, many of whom do not have management plans, don't necessarily think about the value of their land. Could they, um, as they develop a plan, thinking not only about a extractable product, but also maintaining those, that, that forest land in a healthy condition for carbon accumulation, as well as one of the important features and the added value of having these lands kept in forests. Is there a water quality um, aspects to it in terms of maintaining cleaner downstream flow? 
there's bio biodiversity concerns, there's recreation opportunities, but all of these net out and are stackable when we think about keeping forests and, and their condition, even as we think about um, carbon. So we being able to better understand the economic drivers of the different products is a clear part of what um, has to be included in any kind of, whether it be legislation or action that needs to take place. And so lastly, and one of our challenges was um, to, to think about what is needed as we go forward that could be uh, the focus of research. And so I did, I did put down a few ideas that uh, we might use to, to think about future or further conversation. I've tried to, the first one is one that I think um, I've mentioned a couple times, but it keeps coming up. And that is, what's the scale of the analysis we're thinking about? Um, I have sometimes sat in meetings surprised at the um, push to look at things at a stand level when as forest managers, we've been thinking landscapes and watersheds for a very long time and, and the management at that scale. And so being able to better understand what the reasons for that and the, under, the underlying concerns, and then how do you integrate multiple stands so that you are at, a, at the entire landscape, you're continuing to accumulate carbon and being able to address that which means we have to be able to follow the carbon. We need to be able to monitor it, measure it, and estimate carbon stocks. The good news in the US is that we have a, a forest inventory analysis program that's been going on almost 85 years at a, at a fairly broad scale, but it has given us the basis to understand what, um, how forests are regrowing or not across the country and by region and through um, through calculus, being able to estimate carbon stocks. The um, good news is the FIA program is looking at small area estimates to be able to get at that, that smaller scale that a lot of uh, people feel is needed to be a more effective. Um, then also you want to think about who is it who's going to be valuing this material and or ensuring that you're achieving the, the success you want. And uh, I think, think we need to think more about forest certification and its role as a third party verifier of carbon management. We do have a very robust forest certification programs and system in the United States and actually globally. And it's, um, I think, the opportunity to take that and because everybody uses it. I mean, that's one thing that the industry has really supported. How do we then look at it in terms of carbon? What might that change look like? So something along those lines in terms of third party verification becomes, I think, pretty critical. And then we still have a lot of, I haven't mentioned offsets yet, and I know it's come up and, and will probably come up in further in some of the conversations. There is a lot of activity in the offset field. A lot of big companies are trying to buy and, and are purchasing carbon offsets. But um, we have multiple systems and really no overarching policy that would systematize that entire process and, um, and making sure that we're apples and apples and not apples, oranges, and kumquats, if you will. And, and I think the opportunity is there. There's certainly a willingness, but especially within some of the big investors, to look at this in a much more deliberate way. And, and I hope, I think actually some of the conversation tomorrow will get there. A lot of what I've talked about has probably had more of a private lands focus, but we can't ignore for the federal forest estate, um, not only in terms of the sheer extent of the opportunity for reforestation and for creating healthy forest stands, um, but the, the investment that would be required to do that, and then the long-term um, risk associated with those sites that would require active management to keep them functioning. In addition is how do you use those areas to achieve some of the carbon goals that we have and what is that, what's the actual number for that um, in the long run. And then finally, as discussed in a recent paper in science by Andrew et al, um, there's a lot of risk associated with forests and being able to incorporate that risk into the um, amount of land set aside or, or or tagged as a as a carbon um, for carbon or climate mitigation through carbon. How do we build that in? What's the projections associated with that? And I've actually heard over the years one one interesting point that for at least the private land side, 
to reduce, have risk reduction by having the federal lands be in the surety or insurance for those private land investments. Is that even legitimate? So I think all of those areas are um, not insurmountable, but that would give us, I think, a, a much stronger basis for being able to do the right calculation at the right scale over the right time and give us some level of confidence that, in fact, these these um, treatments will add up, these activities will add up to a successful um, use of forests and reforestation. So thanks very much and I'm looking forward to further conversation on this. Great, thank you so much, Anne. I really like also how you ended with uh, future research opportunities. Um, I know we've got a couple questions in already, so I'll hand it over to Jenny. But um, before that, I wanted to just mention that um, uh, if anyone does have any comments on some of those re uh, research opportunities, uh, using the Q&A function to um, ask questions or thoughts about it would be great. Okay, Jenny. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And Anne, thank you. That was fantastic talk. Lots of information there. I'll go to Shafiq, who has a couple of questions. Shafiq, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your questions? Thanks, uh, Jenny. And I had a question in terms of, you said close the balance on the uh, uh, forest. Where, where are the largest uncertainties that lie in trying to close that balance today? Where do you see the, the biggest uh, challenges? Um, since we do have such a large area of private forest lands where um, there's not an integrated management approach, to me, I think that would be where some of the great gains could be made. and. And I say that because you do, you, as I said, you have these 11 million forest landowners, many who seem, who are not um, locally based. A lot of them are absentee or only use their properties for recreation purposes, which is a valid use. But being able to capture that community and to give them the tools that they need, which means we're talking about incentives. And I think um, there are market-driven incentives, but there's also those that we've used successfully at USDA for conservation purposes. And, and I'd love to really test those um, more, more deliberately in the forest landscape. Um, I guess the other piece I would just mention is the, the, um, the challenges we have in the federal lands because we're mostly in the West. We've always had this notion if you're using, if you're cutting wood for a product, you've got to get whatever it is, it could be thinnings for um, wildfire uh, protect prevention, you've got to get the wood to a mill or to a facility for treatment. An innovation would be as if we could get the, the facility to where the wood is so that you're reducing transportation costs, you're increasing the efficiency. And what could that look like? And I haven't seen a whole lot of work on that, but I, I think the opportunity is, is really quite strong there. Yeah, so I think, thank you for that. Um, Michelle, we have you back, I think. Can you ask your question there? Okay, I think I did it. Can you okay, hear me now? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Great, sorry. The, the button kept on vanishing on me. Um, well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, it, it's really informative, and um, I see that you cited some of the work of my colleagues at the Nature Conservancy. And I just wanted to see if I get your thoughts on, you know, we, we highlight substitution and opportunities for reduction potential there through wood products. One um, I'm still trying to think through is how do we, you know, it, we can model it and see evidence that, you know, we can reduce emissions and climate impacts that way. But how do we in real time um, monitor substitution and, um, and reductions, you know, to, to actually ensure those benefits are happening? Um, and that's where I get stuck. Like we could, we can monitor it in the forest and do inventory there. But as things start to travel down through the supply chain, it seems like it gets more challenging and there's more uncertainty introduced um, as things move through the supply chain. So do you have any thoughts on how we might be able to track that in real time to actually ensure those, we get those benefits? Yeah. Um... Amazon's to be doing that pretty well <laughs> through its tracking of products. And I think that's who you'd want to engage with is the, the manufacturing and the, support, the business um, side of the equation to talk through what, what are the systems that we have in place already 
that perhaps could be amended or could be a could um, serve as the basis for doing that real time tracking. You know, for example, and this is analogous but not directly related, there is a thing called the National Establishment Trends Survey that gives you accurate information for every business and every zip code on um, what the income is, what the outgo is, what the labor force is. And that gives you very powerful information to know what's happening at a business level, but then can be aggregated by a community level. So people know how to report things in, in a very deliberate way. I think the increasing automation of some of this reporting, I, you know, I joke about Amazon, but there's a reason why their logistics work so well, because there is a, a really rapid tracking. So how could you apply that kind of technology to some of the questions that we have? Um, that if you look at a mill, there, mills are, are metered. There's energy being metered. There's water being metered. How else uh, could that be adjusted? We put in um, those, not transponders, but the barcodes on particular wood so that as, as a, a tree leaves a forest to a mill, people can track it. And this has to do with illegal logging. So um, I think we're only limited by our imagination on this but we'd have to ask the question to the right community who would then want to be making those kinds of investments. And um, just my guess, my last point on this, and I hadn't thought about it until you raised the question. If you have the Amazons and the Delta Airlines and the McDonald's investing in offsets because they see some value in it, they're going to want to track that investment. And so they have an incentive, I think, to think and help answer the question you were just posing.